You're good, Steve. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, Steve, unlo un unmute yourself, Steve. Okay, am I on? Yes. Welcome, everyone. It's good to see everybody here tonight. I'm the Mecklenburg Audubon president, Steve Coggin, and thanks for coming to our October meeting. Christine has put together a short slideshow with some recent bird sightings and other important information to start us off. So, Christine. Hi, everybody. I'm Christine McCluskey, the vice president at Mech Audubon. Uh, I'm glad to see everyone tonight. I missed last month's show, unfortunately, but I did watch the recording and I thought it was excellent. So hopefully we'll continue to have some great monthly meetings. Tonight, as um, I'm sure most of you know, we are here to hear, uh, have a talk from Tiffany Kirsten. She is um, doing a birding big year and um, she has a particular take on this and a personal story about elevating women birders. So we're really eager to hear from her tonight. This is just a reminder that Winghaven is having their symposium. Uh, this year it's called Birds to Words and um, it has a lot of their usual um, leanings towards gardening and writing and, and other things like that, but um, with an undercurrent of bird theme. So this year we're involved as a gold sponsor and we are, some of our board members are, are guiding walks on, um, I believe it's a Wednesday, November 3rd, and there's some virtual conversations happening, stuff you can do over Zoom, and including a talk by the um, Andrew Hudson from Audubon, North Carolina, and there's a cocktail reception. So if anybody's interested in checking that out, you can just go to the Winghaven website. It's a fundraiser. So just know that some of the things are a little pricey, but it's for a good cause. All right. I'm gonna go over some sightings that some folks were kind enough to share their photos. You wanna take this page, Steve? Yeah, out on Lake Norman, uh, over in Lincoln County a couple of weeks ago, we saw a Hudsonian Godwit, and I think that was the first time it had ever been recorded in that county. And it was a very nice bird. It let us watch for about 15 minutes, and uh, everybody in the boat got good looks. And then people went back that afternoon, right? Yep. And? And you'll see what I got, a Forrester's turn. <laughs> <laughs> it had gone. So, out, so there on the, out there on the big water, there are birds that are typically there in the winter showing up. So gulls, terns, some shorebirds, and the ducks are starting to come in too. Yeah, it's a nice, this is a nice time of year as we have um, fall migration still trickling through and some new stuff coming in. Uh, so you gotta get out there to see it. Um, this is some photos that Jeff Turner was kind enough to send in. He had a, a a great photo of a Tennessee warbler trying to pry open a leaf um, that was at Jackson Park uh, a few days ago, I think, or last week. And um, this, I really like this artsy picture of a Eastern Phoebe. It's a juvenile and you could see that its tail feathers are just starting to come in. Um, and I thought that was a really cool picture and that's from Clark's Creek. And you can look right through the tail feather too. It's just amazing. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? Uh, you want to do this one, Steve? Okay. Uh, our own Steve Jenkins, Sea Doc, has a terrific set of pictures of barred owls that he's lucky enough to have living and nesting in his backyard. And here's one giving us a, a dark eyed stare. And Carol Atwater, who we saw, has joined us tonight had a Cooper's hawk, looks like it's sitting on top of a feeder in her backyard. Mm -hmm. And Gretchen Losey, uh, one of our South Carolina members, 
found a solitary sandpiper in Rock Hill a couple of weeks ago. Very nice. I love that look on the Cooper's Hawk, that fierce hood. They always kind of have that look. I'm, I'm not that great at identifying a, a, a Cooper's versus a Sharpie um, when they race by or off in the distance, I struggle. But when you can get a good look at that face and that eye ridge, it kind of is a, is a good indicator for me. Richard, um, who heads up our field trips, is, uh, as many of you know, we've seen lots of his pictures. And uh, I love this series of beautiful yellows that he's been seeing in the last uh, week. So he had a Cape May warbler, a magnolia warbler, a beautiful black-throated blue warbler in the bottom left corner. And um, that's the warbler that has the little kerchief patch on its wing but the male and the female are very different. The male is, is that beautiful blue and black color, um, but she's quite stunning in her own right, in her, in her yellow colors there. Um, and also a summer tanager, which I noticed he had another one posted today. So I guess it's sticking around his yard. I want to tell a little story about a black throat blue warbler we saw in Florida last week. It didn't have the little white patch on the wing, and it took us forever to figure out what it was. But after reading deep into the field guides, it seems first year female birds don't necessarily have to have that. Ah, so, tricky. Yeah, it was real tricky. Just to, you know, fall warblers aren't tricky enough, then you have to get all these little exceptions <laughs> just, just to keep you on your toes. Um, and, and speaking of a black throated blue male, yeah. There's, there's one here. Um, this is a great picture of it on some beautyberry. My beautyberry, I planted some uh, last year. Maybe Actually, maybe it was two years ago. And this year is the first year it really took off and, and has a lot of berries. Now, this isn't my photograph, um, but it's just to give you a, a hint of, of the plantings that you can do to help bring the birds to your backyard. So as we remind you in spring, we remind you again in fall, now that the weather's cooling off, um, it's time to plant for birds. And so you can go to ncaudubon.org and it has a, it's a great starting point um, that lets you put in zip code and figure out what plants are, are good for our area. A lot of local resources on where you can get the plants. So I would recommend doing whatever you can to reduce your invasives and in increase your natives. All right, it's time to reveal the leaderboard. And, and thank you to Betty for setting, sending a, a really cute photograph of a ruby-throated hummingbird that she had at, at her feeders recently. Um, you wanna go through some of these, Steve? Yes, there's some astonishing numbers here. Uh, <laughs> we were talking with Jeannie before we got started. And 114 species in her yard. I'm just stunned. Yes, impressive. Dennis, Dennis Kent with 96. Melissa and Gretchen with 95. Strummer and Wayne with 91. Ron and Steve both in... Uh, where are they? Um, oh, good Gaston question. County, maybe? They're in Gaston County. Yeah, Gaston, Gaston County. yeah. And uh, I don't think I've written a list in my yard in a few weeks, so I'm down there in the other category. The other is called <laughs> Rowan I'm County. I'm about at the same point you are, Steve. I think <laughs> I've, I've kind of hit a lull and did a lot of traveling this summer, so I haven't yeah. added so many. But man, these, these numbers are great. Yes. Uh, we need field trips to certain yards, I'd say. Yeah, that may be. That may be. Uh, I saw that Jeannie, Jeannie earlier said that she's near water and has sort of a, a fake stream in her yard. And I, I, I think that's a, a big key from what I understand. Um, that, that water feature is a, a big draw. So obviously it's working for Jeannie. Okay, we're gonna start our show in a minute, but we wanted to give you guys a, a preview of um, next month. 
for the November meeting, um, thus far, it looks like we will probably continue continue with Zoom. We'll keep you posted though. We're always monitoring the situation in hopes that someday soon we can safely <laughs> meet in person um, or at least give people that option. So that's what we're looking for. But um, earlier this summer, this year, this which was late summer actually, the first week of August, um, Steve and Diane Coggin and myself and Malia, uh, Malia Klein and a, a few of my friends from New York um, went on a birding trip to the Sky Islands. Um, and that's the different mountain ranges in Southeast Arizona, close to the Mexico border. And um, they have a monsoon season hopefully each season around that time. And this year we were fortunate that they did have a lot of water and a, a lot of bird and wildflower and animal activity when we were there. So some people say it's crazy to go to Arizona at that time, um, but you start in the lowest elevations early in the day and try to escape the heat by climbing the mountains later on. And um, what'd you think, Steve? Was it worth it going to Arizona in the, in the heat of the summer? Well, I was one of those people who's a little skeptical about going to Arizona in August, but I've been converted. There said, you go. Do it. There you go. So um, we're going to do a, a, a slideshow of some of our favorite moments and, and all that from a, from a, a trip report from the four of us. Uh, and that's next month on our first Thursday, November 4th. So we hope to see you guys there. We're looking forward to sharing our stories. And that's it. Um, it's time to get started. Um, Steve, if you want to take it away, we, I, we can um, go through the field trips. I'm not sure if you or Richard is going to talk about those. I'd like to do a little something before we go to the field trips. Uh, sure. I'd like to recognize some of our newest members. Nancy and Mary and Dominic and Margaret, Emer and David, Peggy, Suzanne, Jamie, Margaret, Mark, Linda, Susan, welcome all. And if you'd like to become a member, uh, you can join Mecklenburg Audubon for one year for only $10 or $15 for a whole family. Well, that's a bargain. It, it is the best deal on the planet. <laughs> so you can go to mechbirds.org, click on the word join, and then you can become a member. And uh, Richard Pocat, our field trip coordinator, will tell us about some upcoming bird walks and field trips that we have on our calendar. Okay, give me just a moment and I will call those up. Okay, you seeing my screen? Yes. Yes. All right, great. Richard. We want to really thank um, uh, Judy and Ron for carrying a big part of the load. Also, thank you to Steve. Uh, we have a big sit in Union County coming up uh, on this weekend on Saturday uh, that Martina is doing. Uh, do please contact, if you're planning on going on a walk. Sorry, trip guys. Leader. <laughs> and uh, and let them know uh, your contact information. And if you have some change in plans, uh, that is, if you are finding that you're not going to be able to go, please let them know as soon as possible so that um, if they have a waiting list, that we can have other birders that will be given the opportunity. Also, not to, if you, we have, we need your contact information so that you can, like today, I or I canceled last night. I know Ron canceled his his trip because we both thought it was going to be too wet. Um, right. But um, so we'll try to do that early early the evening before. Uh, but even so, uh, there's also been other times when I've woken up and I haven't been able to move uh, or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, so we need to know, you know, get your contact information so we can let you know what's going on. Or, or maybe if you're late, we can call and make sure you're not stuck in a ditch somewhere. Yes, that's very good. <laughs> so, 
So we're trying to send these out at six o'clock on Sunday nights and uh, give you a little advance warning, but it's always, always available also on the website. There is um, a link for bird walks in the calendar. Great. All right. Well, thank okay. you, everybody. Yes, thank you, Richard and Judy. And do we have Tiffany? Yeah, so we're on there. Go ahead and well, do Matthew, the introduction. Matthew, could you please introduce our speaker? I would be happy to. Our guest tonight is joining us from all the way out in California, where I believe she just picked up some pretty good birds. So I don't know if she's going to tell you about that, so I won't ruin it for everybody what she got. Um, she is a biologist, educator, and lifelong public servant who lives out of the Rio Grande Valley in Texas, where she's the owner and operator of Nature Ninja Birding Tours and a field rep for Swarovski Optics. Uh, she's doing a, having a pretty big year this year, so I'll go ahead and turn it over to Tiffany Kirsten. Hi, thank you all for having me. Um... Super excited to be here. I thought I would be presenting from Texas, but as per typical big year um, plans, there is no planning to be done. So I actually booked a last minute plane ticket yesterday to, from California to, uh, to California um, for two birds today. Um, so picked up um, Emperor Goose and Dusky Warbler uh, in the kind of Sacramento area. So I'm here um, actually with a friend who's trying to get his first magnolia warbler for uh, Yolo County, Sacramento, California area. It's a really rare bird out here. So I'm like, I could kind of care less about <laughs> magnolia <laughs> warblers, but it was a good good spot for me to do my presentation. So um, thank you, Matthew, for, for suggesting me as a speaker and I'm super excited to be here. Um, let me pull up, I'll share my screen with you. Um, let me pull up my presentation. While she's doing okay. that, while she's doing Maybe. that, make sure you can um, put questions into the chat. Sorry, I, uh, Tiffany, I needed to make you a co-host again. You should be good Got now. It. Oh. Okay. Good. All right, you all can see that? Yes, we can. Okay. So um, I started out my year not anticipating doing a big year. Um, I left my position managing a nature center um, after six years of doing so last fall and was kind of trying to figure out what was next. Um, and so I started uh, bird guiding uh, in the interim while I was applying for jobs in other places and locations and not really sure where my life was going. Um, bird guiding picked up like crazy. Um, in the fall and then I decided to go to Florida with a friend in January and um, that friend had never birded Florida before so we make sure it got all the all the birds there and all the rarities um, but anyway so long story short I'll get a little bit more into kind of how that all went um, but I am doing a lower 48 states big year um, from January to December uh, with a mission to see 700 species in the lower 48 states while working to make birding a safer space for women. Um, I have been, as Matthew mentioned, uh, an environmental educator, done lots of work in visitor services, um, worked for US Fish and Wildlife Service, um, New Jersey Audubon, Massachusetts Audubon, got to do some really awesome field work banding honey creepers in Hawaii. Um, and uh, that's, a, that's an osprey chick there on the left um, that I got to the, go ahead and band. So lots of really hands-on work, um, both with birds and working with people. Um, I've been a bird watcher since I was about 12. My mom uh, took me to a local nature center and we had a, like a six or eight week kind of beginning birders class. And uh, I saw a flock of about 2000 sandhill cranes um, in a Wisconsin cornfield. So basically from then I was a backyard birder for a while, really got more into it in college. Um, but then several years ago, kind of my more hardcore birding ended. I just have so many different hobbies um, that they all kind of away. So here I am um, with a large group of birders at Estero State Park in the Rio Grande Valley. Um, and uh, there was a gray crowned yellow throat. So some of my other hobbies, I was a semi-professional Latin dancer for a little while. I took up pole fitness for a little while. Um, I got started in competitive 
uh, target tree and was actually uh, starting to be with um, a lot of the men um, that had been shooting for years, which was kind of crazy. And, um, oops, sorry, I'm trying to adjust something on my screen here. Um, so, uh, and then, uh, yes, yeah, so I did that for a while. I was trained to, to train, uh, to compete in the largest archery competition in the world, actually, which is held in Las Vegas every year. And, um, and very unfortunately, I was assaulted um, by an archery coach. Um, so needless to say, I left that um, sport very quickly. I, um, I took up the chat box here and now I can't get rid of the chat that's right in front of my face. Can't find my cursor. Let's see. There we go. Sorry about that. Um, from there, I start, got into acro yoga, which is like the yoga um, training for a warrior. I just have really intense patterns. I find something and I just run with it. So there really wasn't time for all my other patterns combined with birding. Um, but then COVID happened. And as everyone knows, COVID's affected lots of other people in lots of different ways. And for me, it meant shutting down my three gyms that I had memberships at and shutting down the, the social Latin dancing that I was still doing and, and all the social hobbies, right? So I was like, well, I guess there's nothing left to do but go birding again. <laughs> um, and then, as I mentioned, I had lost my job. I started guiding, went to Florida in January with a friend. Um, we had really great luck with the rarities in the Florida Keys. So on the left, there is a Cuban peewee. On the right, there's a yellow, uh, red-legged thrush. Um, center there, a black-faced grass foot. And then a flamingo showed up in the Keys like as we were driving down um, to get there. So it was perfect um, to be able to get that bird too. A nemesis of mine for years. Um, and then I went back, got back home January 10th and guided in the Rio Grande Valley uh, into the rest of the January. And uh, we had a really, really great luck with a lot of rarities. Um, this winter, we had about 12 crimson collared gross beaks. That's the bird on the upper right. We had a long staying elegant trogon on the left, um, which is a pretty rare bird for Texas, actually. They're mostly found in Arizona. Um, and then ruddy ground dove on the bottom there. Um, so I guided another big year birder. His name is Charlie. He's doing an ABA big year. Um, I shouldn't say another big year birder because I wasn't doing a big year at this point. But, um, you know, he was like, well, you're in between things and you're bird guiding. So why don't you just piece things together and bird guide and also do your own big year? And I was like, that's crazy. I have a house. I have a mortgage. I, you know, I need to find a job. I'm unemployed. Um, so then kind of time just went by. I guided a little bit more. I decided to take a trip out to... Arizona, um, there were five life birds I needed. I still needed violet crowned hummingbird and uh, there was a rufous backed robin around. So I was like, well, I'll just take a road trip, drive out you know, to Arizona, spend a week and then drive back. Um, and I was leaving this park, Franklin Mountain State Park in El Paso. And I flushed some scaled quail with my car on the way out, realized that was a 287th bird that I had seen that year on February 10th. Um, and people at this point were contacting me, noticing eBird, noticing I had a pretty high number. And they're like, are you doing a big year or doing a big year? No, I'm not doing a big year. So then I was like, okay, I'm doing a big year. Um, I don't know what's going to happen. I might have to get a job at some point. Uh, I don't know where, you know, I don't know what my goal is at this point, but I'm going to go to Arizona. I'm going to see how many species I can see and then maybe continue on from there. Um, so I, um, here's pictures from Arizona and from California. Uh, on the beach there, I was looking for a Pacific golden plover, um, camping outside of San Diego and camping at the base of Miller Canyon um, in Arizona. Um, I should mention, I, I used to carry a nice camera, a nice DSL cam DSLR camera, and I actually sold it a few years ago, thinking that I really wouldn't use it again. I really wasn't much. Um, and so all of the photos that I'm showing you in this presentation are actually taken with my iPhone um, through either my Swarovski binoculars or my Swarovski spotting scope. So they're digibind or digiscoped. Um, so they're not going to be the best quality photos ever, but I've gotten pretty decent at taking documentable photos, at least through both devices. Um, so then I found myself in really remote areas. This is uh, Florida Canyon um, in Southeast Arizona. 
where I went looking for and eventually found after a couple of visits, um, black cat knack catcher. And um, I, you know, it's, well, I was hiking up here, I was hiking alone. Um, so February 10th, I committed to doing a big year. Um, a few days later, um, a woman came out, um, if, the, if some of you probably have been following um, with allegations against another young birder. Um, she said that she was assaulted um, while birding with him. And so that really kind of resonated me as a sexual assault survivor myself. I was like, what am I doing? I just committed to spending all this time alone in the woods. You know, am I making the right life choice here? Or am I just setting myself up for this to possibly happen to me again? Um, so, but I continued through Arizona. I was like, I still want to do this big year, um, but I want to find a way that, that there's a mission outside of myself. Um, so here are a few of the birds I got, Williamson sapsucker on the right, uh, violet crowned hummingbird in the middle, um, Arizona woodpecker, cute little brown woodpecker on the left there. Um, continued through and, um, you know, found myself in these situations where I was like, well, what do I do? Why is there a picture of a hotel room in my presentation? <laughs> Y'all are thinking. Yeah, on my way and uh, way, way for me to think. And I've been just really um, here, budget here. Got to Phoenix, realized there's no way that I could tent camp. Tried to get, um, called some hotels. Nobody had room. It was Valentine's Day weekend. <laughs> um, so, you know, the, this one room was available, $212. I had looked on Airbnb um, for a couple of rooms. And there were rooms available for, there were two rooms available at two different places for about $50 a night, but they were, there were um, houses that were owned by, it was just one man um, listed um, on the listing. So I was like, well, that that's, as a woman traveling alone, that's not something I could do. So this is my $212 hotel room um, in, in Phoenix. And, you know, I consider it essentially $150 tax for being a woman because when we travel, we can't do some of the things that men are able to do, um, including, you know, sleeping in your car, at rest stops and things like that. I uh, continued on to California, still on my mind, still thinking I need to have a mission for this year. What is this view? I'm just going and see how many birds I can check off. Um, you know, I, I've never considered myself a lister. I still don't really consider myself a lister and I'll get a little more into that later, but um, here I was listing birds in California. So uh, white take, white wagtail upper center there, um, rock sandpiper off on the right in uh, San Francisco, um, picked up a bunch of other birds as I was there as well. Um, got to go on a, on a pelagic San Diego birding festival too. So this was uh, mid February now. From there, I flew to Minnesota, um, picked up short-eared owl, spruce grouse. Um, some birds are not as um, fashionable ways to get. I got my black duck um, in a parking lot, still sitting in the car. Um, and then black woodpecker there on the right. Uh, traveled through New Mexico, um, went to see I saw three species of rosy finches up there. Uh, I had a really sketchy moment. And very rare, there's no exception. Um, it was early in the morning on a weekday. I was the only person on, uh, by myself. And the, the host you usually the rosy finches from is cl was closed due to COVID. So you could view the birds uh, from the parking lot. Um, and just kind of watch them basically from your car. So I was, I got there and I set everything up. It was cold out. So I set up my scope outside of my car and then I jumped back in my car waiting for the birds to flock in because they all fly into the feeders in just one giant swarm. It's a really cool thing to have together. Um, so <clears throat> I was up there, no cell reception, you know, just all by myself. And this white truck came up also and parked nearby me, kind of on the other side of the small parking lot and just kind of, idled there for a while okay whatever you know and but there's not much to see aside from the birds you know the house isn't open nothing's going on up there well these two gentlemen got out that had you know low low slung jeans and tennis shoes they just weren't dressed to be at the top of a mountain twelve thousand feet um you know in in the cold of winter um so they kind of loitered their way out to the point that you see in this picture on sandia crest and kind of loitered their way back and i i fall out by the time they came back um they they loitered by their trucks some more. I was having pretty much a full out panic attack. Um, probably some of it was due to like 
the the shortness of oxygen in the air at that level anyway but i was you know kind of developing an escape plan and okay if i just need to drive off and leave my scope here like it was just a really really scary vulnerable moment they looked and fit and i didn't have seven no one around so uh, i was still working on trying to figure out what my mission would be um and so a few days after the the notice of this um birding assault came out uh this company called birdie showed up in my social media um and they don't actually have anything to do with birds they're called birdie because their hashtag is chirp loudly the, the alarm when you pull it you know kind of chirps supposedly sounds like a bird so I reached out to them um, and I had a private donor donate um, the first hundred alarms. And so my mission would be to distribute these alarms to women that I meet along the trails uh, throughout the course of my big year. And um, so that's what I've been doing. And I launched my blog and my fundraiser on International Women's Day intentionally um, in an effort to become the youngest woman to see 700 species in a year. Um, so really uh, working to empower women, working to, um, you know, elevate women um, beyond kind of the basic birder level, not that there's anything wrong with being kind of an entry level or intermediate birder, but for those, there's really a lot of in, in the guiding arena and um, in the more competitive birding arena, there's really women are lacking severely. Um, so International Women's Day, I launched my blog. Um, launched my fundraiser. And so I'm collecting funds for each $50 raised. Um, the company is giving me another alarm to um, distribute on to another woman on the trails. I went to Hatteras, North Carolina in May um, on Kate's boat. Kate is super awesome. If uh, probably a lot of you guys have had a chance to get onto her boat, if you haven't do so. Um, she's a super, super powerful woman and definitely holds her own. She's amazing at identifying seabirds um, and really, really great with the people and getting people on the birds and whatnot. So it was really cool. Um, all five of us in this picture, plus um, there was another one that left before the picture. We're all on the boat on our own accord, which I thought was really cool. You know, it wasn't someone was there all oh, because their male spouse was a bird or whatnot. Uh, everyone was there specifically because they wanted to be there, which I thought was really awesome. Um, so I gifted them all personal safety alarms as well. Um, here's some photos of the alarms I've been gifting along the way. Um, I just gave out my 172nd alarm um, to a woman here at the site that I'm currently at with the Magnolia Warbler. Um, some more here. This woman um, is an Asian woman uh, who recently lost her, her husband and her dad and is now navigating this world in this awful time of Asian hate. Um, so gifted her an alarm and, and ended up actually guiding her a couple other spots in the US later on this year. Um, more alarms gifted out. It's been really cool to see, um, you, so, you know, things, something happens psychologically with someone when you give something someone, they kind of open their heart to you. And so it's been really powerful to me, um, you know, healing to me and helpful to everyone, I think, in having these open conversations about women's safety and, oh, you know, nothing ever happened to me, but I was at, you know, I had this thing that happened that was really sketchy and this, that was really sketchy. So it's been really cool to connect with women, their stories. And I've been sharing some of that in my blog as well. Um, so then I went to Colorado and uh, got three-toed woodpecker and ptarmigan there, boreal owl. Uh, three and a half days managed to clean up on all the Colorado stuff. Uh, went back to Arizona for the spring birds, got buff collared nightjar. Wouldn't be a complete big year if it wasn't for a flat tire. So we had rented a, a forerunner and managed to get a flat California gulch um, and met up with some other birders when we were down there. So um, really fun time. We had a little tailgate picnic and, and a really awesome time uh, camping down there for a buff collared night jar. Uh, that's been one of my favorite things about doing a big year, I think, is you go to these corners of the US that you otherwise have no reason to go to. California Gulch is really out of the way of anything else. Um, and really you just go there for buff collared night jar and, um, and five stripe sparrow. 
So next I went to Maine where I guided at the Acadia Birding Festival and I was actually fortunate to be able to co-lead the Bicknell's thrush trip, which is a, a rare species of thrush that nests only in uh, these alpine um, tops of the mountains in um, like Maine and New Hampshire, New England area. And so it was cool to get up there. And we just had to make the hike on down. So it was pretty crazy. Um, there I went to Washington and um, got Black Swift, which was a life bird for me. So that was really cool. Really awesome views. I had actually never been to Washington State before that trip. Um, then I went to Wisconsin, got my Kirtland's Warbler, and also got Carner Blue Butterfly. And these, these were really special for me because I actually grew up in Wisconsin. And um, I did two years worth of Kirtland's Warbler surveys um, for the U.S. Forest Service in marginal habitat. Um, and they weren't, really, they weren't really established in northern Wisconsin at that time, which they are a little bit more now. Um, but this was actually my life for Kirtland's Warbler after doing two years of surveys and not seeing or hearing a single one. Um, and same with Carner Blue Butterfly. It was doing surveys for them too a decade ago. Um, never had found one, so pretty cool. Then went to Minnesota, North Dakota, got LeConte Sparrow and got um, Connecticut Warbler. It's really cool to see Connecticut Warbler in breeding habitat. That was new to me. And uh, Redneck Grebe. Uh, then I got home and I was sitting home and I, yeah, I mentioned that I work on the side for Swarovski. Um, my boss with Swarovski, Clay Taylor, lives in Corpus Christi and he called me and I figured he called and wanted to talk about um, one of the upcoming birding festivals that I was going to be working at in Arizona, but he called me and he said, no, green-breasted mango in my yard. Um, and I was like, what? No, what? Like, really? So I jutted my way up there as quick as I could, about two and a half hour drive and, and got that. I was number 645 for the year. Oh, here's a little better photo. I went back again uh, a day or two later to just try to get a better photo of it. Um, handed out a lot more alarms when I was there. The alarm, the alarm uh, company started sending me all the different colors that they have. Um, and uh, so it was cool to network with more women um, there. Then I went to Florida um, again. I had started in January. Oops, actually, I didn't include in the presentation. I, I flew to Florida also for um, Western Spindalis. It was the only bird at that time I had flown specifically for a rarity and got it. So then this was my third time down um, camping and gifting more personal safety alarms. Um, I got Antilia Nighthawk. It was super, super hot to camp, tent camp in the Keys. I would not recommend it. <laughs> um, that was what I slept on. I didn't use a sleeping bag or anything. Um, and then I got to go see the yellow green Vireo that had hybridized with a black whiskered Vireo. Um, so I saw both of the adults and then it, it's pretty impossible to see anything in that photo, but I'd actually digis digiscoped. Um, there are two birds in there, even though it doesn't really look like it. Uh, and then I headed down to the Dry Tortugas where I got super lucky and was able to see Black Knotty, which is not an annual bird. Uh, the Black Knotty is on top of the wooden pole and there's a brown knotty for comparison kind of underneath and behind it a little bit. Much more slender bird, a uh, little different shape to the bill. Um, they also got sooty turns uh, on the top there and a couple of bridled turns. So I found out when I was in Florida that there was a Mexican violet ear that was four mi literally four miles from my house. Um, I had left the spot on the map first thing in the morning and I had gotten to Tallahassee around the panhandle of Florida when I found out. And so I decided to drive straight through. Um, it took me 22 hours and 18 minutes to make that drive in order to be home by sunrise the next morning and of course the bird was not there so that was my first really really painful dip of the year but at least I wasn't going in a direction I, I was planning to go home anyway so I wasn't going in a direction that I wasn't supposed to be going in or spending any you know extra money or resources that way so it's a little little easier to swallow then <clears throat> a curlew sandpiper showed up in Mississippi and so I went to go try to chase that and that was a little bit more of a painful chase uh, it wasn't there <laughs> it was there the day before it wasn't there when I got there um so 15 hours one way 15 hours back um I drove all the way out one day and then I said forget it I took two days on the way back and camped and kind of took a little bit more time but um, 
that was a tough miss. Um, but then I flew to Washington for the second record ever of a sharp-tailed sandpiper adult um, in eastern Washington and was able to get that bird. Um, and then flew to Delaware for a day, um, was able to get little egret, finally got mute swan, which was kind of a running joke um, that I still hadn't, got, I hadn't been in an area that mute swans were actually all year. So mute swan was, I think, 665 for my year list. Um, and then also got curler sandpiper. <clears throat> I was working the, the Tucson Birding Festival and there was a report of a rufous cap warbler that came in um, from Ramanote Canyon, which is a super, super remote canyon, had 22 eBird checklists ever there um, before our visit. So, you know, it was four wheel drive vehicle. I had a guide actually that was scheduled to, um, to take me out um, kind of as a favor and, and networking guide to guide as I'm starting my own company. Um, and he kind of canceled on me last minute. So I was like, oh, what do I do? What do I do? I literally posted on Facebook and I was like, hey, if anyone has four wheel drive, um, cause I had actually checked, um, I was like, well, I'll just rent a car for a day. Well, Tucson airport did not have any four wheel drive car rentals. And I was like, I'm really, I'm an hour and a half away from this bird. I cannot be, you know, driving, leaving without getting this bird. Um, when I'm kind of flying to, out to the country, trying to get other ones. So I was able to find, um, Josh here, who was a Facebook friend of mine and said, yes, we'll take you out. Um, went out in his forester and, um, went out and had, it was crazy hike two miles up, two miles back. And it's really really rough. Um, you basically hiked in the creek bottom to get to the bird um, and we finally got it. So that was a success. Maybe my favorite little story with all the little facets of details involved um, for the year. Um, I was supposed to go for Himalayan snowcock um, in between working to two of the different Arizona birding festivals, but there was a giant mudslide that closed off the road to the main spot where snowcock was. So I ended up going back um, later, uh, a few weeks later, flying up and getting cash across Crossville and uh, Tundra Swan. And then there was also a little gull present. So that was kind of a bonus bird that I wouldn't have to worry about later in the year. Um, and then also went for snowcock at a different spot where it was herd only. So um, that's kind of what my year has been um, up until recently. Uh, I most recently did, just came back um, so I haven't been able to upload my photos yet, but from a trip all the way up to Westport, Washington, um, where I was planning to work my way up and do a couple of pelagics along the way, and then kind of take this more inland route south. Um, but I actually had um, super great luck on the San Diego pelagic, um, had Least and Townsend's storm patrols, which are not super common, and also had um, Nazca and red-footed boobies. And then my boat out of Half Moon Bay with Alvaro's adventures, uh, we had really great luck, cleaned up on all the regularly occurring seabirds, plus got Guadalupe Merlet, which meant that I didn't need the boat that I had scheduled for a couple of days later out of Monterey, California. And I actually was able to get off of the wait list for a boat out of Westport a week early. So I got up to Westport, got all the expected birds there also, plus, plus flesh footed shear water, which is another rarity. Um, so then I was able to meander my way back down um, the coast to go for um, Island Scrub Jay uh, out of Ventura and then to do another pelagic where we actually got uh, um, uh, Carveris Merlet and Blue Footed Booby and Blue Footed Booby was actually my 700 bird. Um, so that's um that's kind of where I'm at now and then I you know I was home for less than 48 hours and the reports were coming in from Dusky Warbler and um the Emperor Goose here in California and so yesterday midday as soon as both of them were reported again I was like okay I've got to go um I know I didn't cover quite the last little part of my trip but I am blogging about it um so if you'd like to see the photos um, for that, from that last trip that I haven't had a chance to upload yet um, to my presentation, you can go to my blog there, um, tiffanykirsten.blogspot.com. Um, as I've mentioned, my primary goal has been achieved. I've got my 700 species, and now it's now I'm looking at and kind of crunching the numbers to see. And I think there's a decent chance that I might be able to break the record, which is 724. So I'm at 702 right now. Um, yeah, so the, 
I guess I'll go back to here. So I, I'm here now in California. Um, I'll be at the Cape May Fall Festival with Swarovski and I'll be at the Rio Grande Valley Festival um, guiding in November. I've essentially cleaned up on all the birds, all the regularly occurring birds. I'm just waiting around and deciding whether to chase things. And then in December, I've got some plans for the Northwest for ancient merlite and Falcon, uh, Northern Minnesota for Northern Hawk Owl. And then since I wasn't doing a big year in January, I didn't go to the Northeast in the winter. So I need um, things like thick billed myrrh and scrub jay and Iceland and glaucus skulls um, and king jay. eider. <laughs> Not scrub jay. Yeah, so I guess um, if there's time, we can we can open it up for some questions. I can just stop sharing my screen here. Well, Tiffany, I'll start. Uh, I'll start with a question. Um, as a, as a, what kinds of um, you mentioned a couple of things, a couple of uh, um, situations you were in while you were birding in, in, alone. Um, can you give us some more, uh, maybe, uh, I get this question a lot from, um, the women that I lead. I lead a lot of field trips and, um, they, you know, they say, oh, you go there by yourself or you do this or that. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about that situation and, and what you actually have heard from other women, uh, and some tips and some, along that, that line? Yeah, I mean, it's really tough. Like, I think as a woman, you know, I don't think that the the added risks that apply to us and not men are ever going to completely go away. Um, and you do need, you know, there's a balance between being afraid to go anywhere and really like kind of not living your life or not seeing the birds that you really want to be seeing, you know, or, you know, being completely reckless. Um, so I do when I'm traveling, I do. Um, you know, I have, I have the alarms. I've got some here, actually, I can show you guys. Um, and I ca maybe I can show you guys without deafening you how they work, but essentially you just pull this little top part off here. Um, and uh, then it sounds, it's 130 decibels. So it's really, really loud. Uh, and then there's also a light here. So this is obviously not gonna work in all situations, but it can be kind of a deterrent and attract attention. And it's good, not just in like nature areas, but also, you know, if you're in a busy city, walk into your car, that kind of a thing. Um, so I, I, I carry this with me at all times. Um, I carry a whole stack with them lately. You're cutting that, you're cutting out again, so. When Hey, Tiffany, I'm, I'm going to stop your video. Uh, I'm going to stop oh, okay. your video. I think uh, that'll help with the bandwidth issues. Okay, I can stop it too. Okay, is that better? Oops. Hold on. Okay, I stopped it now. I think we both stopped it and restarted. Great. <laughs> um, yeah, so, I mean, it's, you know, Obviously you wanna use common sense and just be vigilant of your surroundings. I don't know that I have a specific good answer just because I've been traveling alone, obviously doesn't necessarily mean I'm an expert in uh, you know, not being assaulted again or, or robbed or anything like that. Um, but uh, you know, and, and I think I would never suggest to people to go birding alone if they have the option not to. I wouldn't say like never go alone, right? But I mean, if, if you enjoy birding socially, you know, why not see if if a friend can join you or whatnot, um, which I have been doing a fair amount throughout the year, um, you know, birding, birding with friends I have around the country and whatnot. Always nice to have another set of eyes too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That is true. Well, I, I think I really, it really resonated with me that unfortunately that you have to be that way but it sounds like you're alert and you're the big thing is sort of just paying attention to when you feel uncomfortable and even if it's maybe it's not anything but maybe it is so it's good to sort of have a backup and just play it safe which it, it sounds like obviously you're you're very very aware yeah, yeah. I think it's important to trust your intuition. You know, you, you can weigh the pros and cons and try to rationalize things in either direction, um, you know, but, but just, you know, and it was my intuition that was going crazy when I was in Albuquerque, 
you know, on Sandia Crest. I was like, there's just not something right here. They're not actually doing anything wrong. They haven't approached me, at least not yet, but you know, something is just not right. Um, and so, you know, listen to that, listen to that. Your, your subconscious knows. Donna, do you have a question? Turn off, uh, if you uh, unmute yourself. Um, yeah, hi, hi. So this is, uh, this has been, I've been birding for a long time and I do spend a lot of time out by myself. Um, I guess I, I've, I, you know, up until back in the end of the summer when I had an event happen down at the coast, um, it was very frightening. It was very weird. In fact, so weird that a car going by turned around and came back because they were concerned about me. And I do carry mace. Um, I don't have one of the birdie alarms, but I do carry mace um, with me. I, I've had prior experience as well. And it's, it's really quite frustrating that you're out alone and you're walking and when you when you approach, when someone's approaching you from a distance and your heart rate goes up. And I, I don't know if men experience this, but it's just, it's that, that you're breathing, your heart rate, you're looking for the way out. And then you see it's a woman and suddenly you're fine. And, and that's a terrible thing. But um, anyway, that was just my, my take on it. Um, so you do have to weigh out being, you know, enjoying the moment and being able to focus on, on bird watching and then also thinking about your safety as well. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Shannon, unmute yourself. Just wanted to, the audio was going out when you were talking about when you were at that area with the finches um, and those two men. So I didn't, I was just curious, like, um, did, were you in the scope, like everything okay? Like I didn't hear the end of that whole story. Oh, yeah. you, yes. Did you leave? Or? Yeah. Everything was okay. Um, I, um, they I waited for them to leave actually. They left oh. first. Um, awesome. And, you know, I, but I literally, um, like I literally almost, I have a, I have kind of a, a bit of anxiety in my history. Uh, years ago, I would just have, pa I didn't know what they were initially. Sometimes panic attacks don't feel like panic attacks. You don't actually feel the anxiety. Um, for me, I would just almost pass out. And it had been years since that had happened to me. Um, but that was happening. I, I was at my scope and then I was walking just a handful of feet back to my car. And I was like, whoa, I'm going to like pass out like on the ground right here. And then what are they going to do? You know? Um, uh, so, yeah, I mean, it's a lot of it is psychological. It's, it's, and it, for me, it was difficult to separate whatever was happening for me on the psychological and almost like subconscious level versus like rationalizing what was happening. They're over there. They're not doing anything, you know, they're fine. Um, but you, yeah, I mean, it's, it's just really hard to, to judge sometimes. Uh, but yeah, I, I had been thinking about leaving um, and then they ended up leaving. And then I actually stopped. I had had um, uh, Northern Pygmy Owl I had heard on the way up um, and so I wanted to stop and see if I could get a look because I, I heard it and then I was like, I need to get the rosy finches. So then I wanted to come back and see if I could see the owl. Um, and I pulled into that pull off on the way down the mountain and there was the truck again. I was like, nope, <laughs> nope. And so I just took off um, from there. So, but yeah, no, everything did work out fine. You know, they were, they were probably nothing was gonna happen, but once, yeah, it's, it's a psychological component. I think it's really impressive that you don't let it hold you back, that the draw of the birds is enough that you'll just do it as carefully as you can, but you're not going to stop doing it, which I think is just very inspiring. Thank you. Yeah, it's and it's not just, you know, as I mentioned, it's it's not I never set out to do this for me necessarily. I'm not a listener per se. Um, I'm hoping that we're starting my own guiding company. Um, and, you know, with completing a big year and, and maybe even ending up with the record to kind of set the precedent and, and make other women realize there's space for us here. You know, there's space for us at these more advanced levels if, if we want it. Um, and, you know, the mission of, of passing out these, these safety alarms, it rarely do you give something to someone and you're like, I really hope you never use this, you know, but that's what you do when you give out something like a personal safety alarm is this is for you. And I really hope you're never in a situation you have to use it. But you know, giving out 172 alarms 
someone's probably going to have to use it at some point. Multiple people will probably have to use them at some point, unfortunately. Um, so that's really the mission that's kind of kept me, you know, I don't know that I would have continued doing a big year, honestly, after the, the news of the assault came out. Um, if I hadn't had thought of like finding a way to have an, an additional mission rather than just seeing the birds. So um, my GoFundMe is Birdie Big Year, B-I-R-D-I-E, Big Year, if anyone is interested in donating. Um, initially, I was raising um, $50 and then spending some of that to purchase an alarm, but the company um, has been so supportive now for every $50 raised, the 50 goes completely towards um, my travel and it's still, um, they're donating the alarm. So they're essentially matching the donation. Um, and the, the alarms retail at $30 for anyone who's interested in purchasing. There's another small discount if you buy three or more. Um, and then I believe my discount code works on the top of that discount for multiple alarms, um, if you're interested. And she put that discount or that, uh the 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 word the password for that in the chat if you want to copy that so what was your most exciting uh experience you think oh my goodness here there are so many your favorite <laughs> <laughs> um i was at estero state park in the rio grande valley of texas and um a yellow faced grass quit had shown up about 10 minutes before i was there and I was guiding a family. And so they had, I said, we can either wait and see if this bird shows up again or we can continue on. It's up to you guys. And um, they had a five minute family powwow and they said, we decided we want to move on. And I was doing my big year at this point. This was, I think, March. And I was like, oh man, oh, we're going to miss this bird. So we walked about 50 yards and then someone uh, at the feeding station was like, oh, there it is. And so we ran and we saw it for like 10 seconds, less than 10 seconds probably. And then, no, it's never seen again. Um, so yeah, that was a really, really cool bird to get for lower 48 states. You know, they show up in Hawaii on occasion and, um, but yeah. Hey, Tiffany, is there a common bird that's been eluding you all this year? Um, well, mute swan, I think I mentioned was like 665, but I, I, it, was, it was a running joke. Actually, Matthew was part of that running joke in May. I was like, yeah, I don't have mute swan yet. Um, uh, but I but I was intentionally that bird I was trying to see how long I could go without seeing it because I knew I would see it at some point I'm going to be in Cape May next week and there's like dozens of them at the Cape May Hawk watch so um, it was like how long can I go with not seeing that bird um, there are some pretty basic ones that I'm missing um, probably the most basic one I'm missing right now is rusty blackbird <laughs> so I, yeah, I just have to wait for winter for them to come back and I'm sure I'll get it uh, yeah sometimes those those common ones to escape you. But now that you seem to be doing pretty well on target, do you find yourself wanting to nudge your goal? That yeah. Much yeah. I mean, so I got to 700, became the, the youngest woman to ever see 700 in the lower 48 states. Um, now, after today, I'm at 702. I'm considering there's a thick build Vireo that was actually found in Florida earlier today. I'm considering possibly flying there tomorrow um, and then back to Texas. Um, so it's, yeah, it's becoming a matter of, <laughs> and on the finance front, it's becoming a matter of, well, how in debt do I want to go by the end of the year, quite frankly. Yeah, um, I was going to ask you that. It, it must really be a tough balance between sort of following the obsession <laughs> but needing to be grounded in reality. Like what can you really afford to do? And yes, yeah, but I own a house and I need a new roof. I need to put a new roof on my house next year. And, and, you know, venturing in, I've always worked for, for government or for nonprofits and had a set paycheck. So entering into self-employment is also another unknown. Um, but I, you know, I try to remind myself, I'm never, I'm never going to do this again. I'm never going to do this again. You know, so this is my one shot. And um, so I, that was kind of my thinking yesterday when I bought my plane ticket here to California is like, well, you know, my whole life to kind of straighten it all back out. Um, I don't want to, don't want to look back and regret and be like, oh, you know, if I just spent, you know, another two thousand dollars, I might have gotten the record or something. Um, so yeah, so the oh, the record is seven twenty four, um, and I've mapped it out. I need a lot of stuff in New England still, like I mentioned, I need Northern Hawk Owl. Um, so I think that I should be able to get with like with the regularly occurring species and then some kind of expected rarities like barnacle goose and pink-footed goose. Um, I should be able to get 
at least to 716. It's 8 o'clock. Nice. And then it's a matter of some other unexpected rarities showing up and being able to chase them um, from there. So, yeah, it's all a matter of what shows up this, this fall. Great. Last last time I talked to Jeremy, he was shaking in his boots. He's Tiffany. pretty scared right now. Yeah. <laughs> he's pretty scared. <laughs> I don't think he's like coming. <laughs> well, that speaks a little bit to sort of rivalry and competition. I mean, that part must be fun. Yeah, yeah. And it's, you know, talking with Matthew. So I met Matthew in May on the Hatteras Pelagic, and then we connected again when I was on the August boats out of Hatteras. Um, you know, this is, this is like kind of camaraderie and this like, there's some things that big, only other big year birders ex um, understand, like the level of stress. Sometimes it's so, so stressful. Um, and it's like, well, they're just birds, but it's like, oh yeah, but like there's so much money on the line and the records on the line and, um, uh, you know, and, and everyone's watching. That's been another really interesting thing this year. I, I ran into a bunch of people today that were like, oh yeah, I follow you or, oh, we're Facebook friends. You can add me on Facebook if y'all want. Um, and yeah, so, um, you know, it's just, yeah, the right, the rivalry is there, um, a little bit, but like, I, I've, I'm friends with all the other people doing big years this year. Um, you know, the, the ABA birder, um, Charlie Boswick, uh, was one that encouraged me to do the big year. We've teamed up on some of the, some of the travel together. Um, we went to Arizona, um, together with a group of people, um, and then same with the, uh, the McQuaids are a couple that try to see 700 birds in the ABA every year. Um, and then there's a, a general a young man, um, his name is Jason, who actually was here today. I ran into him at the Dusky Warbler um, and he's doing kind of continental ABA. So lower 48 plus Alaska. Um, so yeah, I mean, we, we connect and it, it's everyone that's doing it this year is great. But I can, I can imagine after all the effort you put in for a big year, feeling a little bit intimidated by the idea of someone breaking it. Um, so I've spent, I've managed to only, I have not yet spent 15 grand. Someone asked oh. in the comments how much I've spent. Um, it's been a super, super budget year, you know, staying with friends, having friends pick me up from the airport, driving most places. Um, I, you know, I drove to, from Texas to Florida and back twice. I drove from Texas to Arizona and back twice. I drove from Texas to California and back once. And then this most last trip from California all the way up to um, Washington state and back. I drive a Chevy Spark, so it doesn't take that much gas, tiny little compact car. Um, uh, what else? Yeah, um, the, the stuff that I've been doing with Swarovski has been great. And they've been really helpful in like, I'm going to work the Cape May Festival next week. If I need to fly myself somewhere first, they'll fly me from wherever I'm at to Cape May and then from Cape May to wherever I need to go. Um, so that's helped a lot. And like working the Acadia festival with Swarovski and, you know, being able to use that to go get, you know, a bird that's so remote, um, the thrush has helped a lot too, instead of all the money I would have spent to get there, you know, being, having the trip paid for and, and making a little money, uh, working for them also. So, yeah, the, but the, they get much more expensive from here. So, uh, my ticket here was $750. So each of the birds I got today was three seventy five, <laughs> plus boarding my dog for two nights, plus you know the airport fees for putting my car there. So um, yeah, it's gonna start to get. I'm probably gonna spend another fifteen grand if I'm trying for the record. Marginal what? costs increases. Yeah. Buff. <laughs> what uh, what rarities are you gonna bring in for us? for the uh, te South Texas uh, Lower Rear Grand Festival. Oh, are you gonna be there? We're not gonna be there. We're coming in the day that it ends. And when oh, I say perfect. we, there's several of us on this on this group so um, that are gonna be going on that trip, but it's oh, it, we're gonna awesome. come in the day after. So we want you to find them all and we'll just go get them. <laughs> That's a good time to come. It's actually, I suggest to a lot of people that come right after the festival because they often find something good, you know? Twice we've had Amazon Kingfisher and um, during the festival. And um, yeah, I mean, who knows? It, it's an endless list of possibilities. We could have first um, blue, gray, blue Gray Tanager has been making its way north from, oh, wow. from Monterey. You know, it's never been seen in the US, but I mean, those birds, 
climate change, love it or hate it. Well, hate it, I hate it mostly, but there's, there's, you know, there's silver linings. So some of those birds from Mexico are working their ways up and uh, becoming a lot more regular. Uh, we had lots of um, um, rose-throated bacards. We had probably six bacards in the valley last year. And, um, you know, like even clay-colored thrush 20 years ago was a chase bird for the locals. And now there's 20 clay-colored thrushes at each of our nature sites. They, they nest there. So, um, yeah, we could get We could use a white-throated thrush or like an Aztec thrush. I could use one of those for the year. <laughs> yeah, I'll go for that too. <laughs> yeah. This is, this is a little off topic, uh, but speaking of Mexico, do you, what's the e-birding situation like, like kind of, you know, within a hundred miles south of the border and do you monitor, like, do you get e-bird alerts from Mexico to kind of oh. see what might be like oh, popping had, up? You know, I had never even thought of that. And I need to, I need to think about it. I need to look into that. That'd be cool to monitor. Um, there aren't very many birders though. So like, if you look at some of the bird maps and e-bird, like it just ends at the Mexico border. Uh, there's some birders, I think more and more now in the Monterey area, like three hours south, uh, but immediately adjacent to the border, to the border, there's almost nobody that birds there. Yeah. All right, well, do we have any other questions? I want, I want you to be able to get back to birding here. Might be able to you know, stir up another, another good bird or something before you leave California. <laughs> yeah, waiting for a red-throated pipit. It's a good time of year for them. There you go. All right. Well, thank you, Tiffany, so much. This has been fantastic, and uh, you've been doing a great job. And we continue. We'll, we'll. I'll certainly continue monitoring your progress. Your blog is awesome, and uh, you know, good luck to you and safe travels and. Wait before you go, Tiffany. Can you either send your your uh, address or whatever to either Matt or me, um, so we oh, can sure. send uh -huh. you? I'm gonna put my uh, email too in the comment box right now in case anyone wants it. Okay. Um, but yeah, or why don't you just go ahead and type it in there, and then I'll I'll grab it off the chat. Okay. All right. Okay, Tiffany, I'd like to extend my thanks to what a fascinating and inspiring story you have. And if you know anyone out there who's unable to join us tonight, make sure to tell them this is recorded. It'll be going up on the website in a day or two, right, Judy? Yeah. Okay. Oh, awesome. Awesome. Mm -hmm. And I'll be continuing to speak as well. Um, next year, I'll be keynoting at least two festivals. I'll be at um, San Diego Festival and Acadia Festival. Um, and if, if you're, I don't know, you guys probably will be back to meeting in person then, but I'll have a bit more polished um, presentation that's kind of a bit more centered around, um, you know, my mission and, and personal growth and healing and that sort of a thing more so than, than just the birds. But yeah. Well, that's, that's great. We'll look out for it. Yeah, we'll try to keep a, a, an update uh, of your progress on our on our Facebook page. So oh, awesome. those of you who are online uh, mm -hmm. who follow us on Facebook, we'll, we'll try to give you an update over these last couple of months as, as Tiffany heads off into the to the final stretch. <laughs> Got a sprint, yeah. sprint to the yeah. finish. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we hope that everyone will join us for our next meeting that will be on Zoom on November 4th, and we'll be having Mecklenburg Audubon members talk about birding in Arizona Sky Islands. And we'll hang around for a few minutes. If you'd like to continue to talk, you can unmute yourselves and jump in. And thanks, everyone. Good seeing you, sort of. <laughs> yeah, take care, everybody. Thanks, hey, Tiffany. Thanks Matt, again, Tiffany. Matt, you can't leave. Oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're in charge at the moment. Remember that. <laughs> yep, yep, sorry. Did you stop recording? Okay. Stop recording. <laughs> stop the recording.